a week or so ago began to deal with me on, and I just, I, I want to share it with you today. From 2 Timothy chapter 3, thank you so much for being here. I'll let you sit down here in just a minute. Verse 10. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecutions. Amen. I want to, I want to this morning to just preach, and I'll, I'll try to be considerate of your time, but I want to preach on the subject of through it all. Through it all. Through it all. Through, say it with me, through it all. God bless you. You may be seated. This is a... Uh, interesting book. It's a book of uh, uh, where Paul is writing to Timothy. This is his second letter that he has written to Timothy, who was a young preacher that Paul was mentoring. When we look at Timothy, we we learn that Timothy received his spiritual influence from his mother and his grandmother. And the interesting thing about it is we don't know anything about his father's spiritual heritage or lineage. We, we can't say that Timothy grew up in the church and his dad was a, was a bulwark in the church or his dad was a, a, a part of the church. We, we don't know anything about Timothy other than the fact that he had a mom and a grandma, Eunice and Lois, who were, who were very strong in God and they influenced God in, or influenced Timothy in the ways of the Lord. And, and we, we don't know if his dad was dead or just not a spiritual leader or, or what the situation may be, but Paul had taken Timothy under his wing and he'd be mentoring him, I guess is what we could use it in today's term, that, that he was mentoring him and showing him how he should do and how he should act and what, what should be going on. And he's writing these letters to, to him. And, and in this letter here, Paul is writing to him and warning him of perilous times. Now the previous part of this text is the, is, is the part that we, we hear so much of. We quote it. We can talk about it. Where Paul said that in the last days there will come perilous times. When he said that in the last days, for this we know, that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own self, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Man, we talk about all of these things. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such, he says, when you see these things coming, he says, stay away from those, those kind of people. Turn, turn away, turn away from all of that. He said, they're ever learning and ever coming with the knowledge of the truth. Then he begins to talk about Janus and Jambres who withstood Moses, so they did also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. But he said, but they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. He said, all these people that are coming, that are, that are doing all of these things in these perilous times, he said, all what they're doing, he said, it's all going to come to folly. It's all going to become nothing when you see that. And he said, but, he said, but now, Timothy... It, this is what you may see. This is, this is the age you may live in. But in, in the midst of all of that, he said, you know, you have fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, and patience, my persecutions, my afflictions, which came at me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. Paul is warning him that these perilous times were coming. And, and I believe today we can honestly say we are seeing these things come to pass. We're, we're seeing, we are living now. Now, if you'll notice in what he says, and I've, I've said this before, but when he lists all these perilous times, none of these have anything to do with the economy. None of these have to do with the environment. 
None of these have anything to do politically. But all of what he's talking about is spiritually and moral decay that was going to be so terrible in the last days that Paul said that they're perilous times. Timothy, they're perilous times. And he says, but he, he said, I want to remind you, and he, he does so in verse 10 and 11. He says, you have been taught right. He said, you have been taught right. Timothy, I have taught you what is right. I have shared with you the truth. There's something to be said about the valuableness, if I can use that, if that's a proper way to put this. There is something to be said about the value of knowing what's right. Because knowing what right, what is right, will never go away. You see, you can backslide and turn your back on God and go live any way you want to, but there's always that compass that's in your mind that no matter how bad it gets, you know what's right. And when you get so far gone that you think you're never going to make it, you always have a bearing on where to come back to because somewhere there was a Paul who spoke what was right in your life. Some of us are here today, used to not be here. We used to be in church, then we were out of church. But by the grace of God, when He began to deal with us, we never had to go through a process of wondering where to go because we knew what was right. And as Paul said to Timothy in verse 10, But thou hast fully known. You know what's right. You know what's right. Then he reminds him, as he talks about all of this stuff, he says, But the Lord, he said, You've known my persecution, my afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch and Iconium and at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. endured. But he said, Out of them all, say all, all, the Lord delivered me. Then, then he goes on in the last verse that we read to you today. He, he reminds them that everyone who wants to live for God, Everybody that says, I'm going to live for God. Now, I'm going to substitute a word here, and I don't think I'm taking anything away from or adding anything to right now. So pardon me if I just use a little more as translation. Everyone that's going to live for God is going to go through some stuff. We're going to go through some stuff. You're going to go through stuff. I'm going to go through stuff. I'm going through stuff. You're going through stuff. We've got stuff going on. And if we're going to live for God, He is telling us, He says, don't think for one minute that just because you live for God, you won't go through some stuff. Just because we're living for God and we're covered in the blood and we got the name of Jesus and we got enough of the Holy Ghost where we can talk in tongues like a Chinaman doesn't mean that God's not going to let us once in a while get sick or have COVID or have a family problem or, or struggle with this or struggle with the temptation. But, but what we have to understand is that He said through them all God delivered us. In other words, He kept us he kept us in the midst of it all. Well, hallelujah. So I want us to go back to Acts 14. We'll not look it up, but last week we talked about it in Acts 13 and 14 where he, he talks about these things and, and as he tells Timothy that he suffered these persecutions. Last week, if you remember, we talked about how that, that he came to Iconium after he left Antioch and then after he left Antioch, how that, that God allowed him to be there at Antioch, but when things got crazy then, he took off and he went to Lystra and that's where we closed last week. But, but I went over to Timothy today because he's already through it all now. And he's already through all this stuff. And he looks back, and he looks back and he reflects upon that. And he tells Timothy, Timothy, I went through some stuff at these three places. I went through some stuff at Antioch. I went through some stuff at, at Iconium. And I went through some stuff at Antioch. But he says, but God delivered me from it all. Amen. And Antioch, here, here, now let's look at some of these things because I'm, I'm going to bring these to relevancy here in just a minute where we are. But at Antioch, they saw God do some great things. 
When you read what Paul saw at Antioch when he talked about the, the praying to the unknown God and all these different things that was going on in that, that region and in that time, he was having revival that they would be, they would be promoting him and making movies and going on crusades and, and doing all kinds of things if that was always happening today. But you see, when they got there, there was a lot of people that accepted them and a lot of people that didn't accept them. And there was a lot of opposition. And finally, the Lord just let them know, you need to leave. You need to get out of this town. And the Bible says, and we talked about it at length last week, where they knocked the dust off of their feet. And I'm just bringing this up to speed. Remember we talked about that last week where he knocked the dust off, the things of the world. We get that attitude and all that stuff so we don't carry it on into the next phase of our life. we got to get that, that element off of us. And so he knocked it off of their feet and they went to the next town. But you see, it was a persecution. It was stuff. And God said, you need to leave. And so they just left. And, and that's how God dealt with them. God, God, God got them out of there. God got, that's, that's hard to say, both God, God, it's hard to, but God got them out of there before there was any problem. He just let them know, this is not right for you here, and you need to go. Sometimes in our life, sometimes in our life, God just moves us in a situation you may be in. You may be in a job situation. You may be in a neighborhood situation. You may be going through some stuff in your, some stuff in your life. And God, out of His mercy, in this time you go through stuff, He just slides you right through that where there's no problem whatsoever. And you come out of it and you rejoice and you praise God and you magnify God and you give God glory and you give God praise and say, isn't that wonderful? It's great when God just lets it just go like, and we just move through it like grease lightning, man. We just, it just, it just comes through without a ripple off. And we say, isn't God good? Isn't God good? And then we go on down the road. And then they came to Iconium. And man, what a move of God they had. What a move of God. And then all of a sudden, the Bible says, and we'll not take the time to go, go through all this, but read it, they, they became aware of opposition, that, and, and they, they, they finally got to the place where it said that, hey, they're going to kill you. Notice the first time there was some opposition, so they slid out. Now they went down the road to Iconium, and, and they're at Iconium. We talked about this last week, and the Lord let them become aware of the fact there's some people here who hate you. Remember we talked about the devout women and all the, the big shots and the devout women and, and everybody that was against them, and, and they were going to, and all of a sudden the opposition intensified. The stuff got worse. And they had to sneak out of Iconium. The first time, they stood up in front of everybody. We're out of here, folks. And they smacked their shoes, and they walked on down the road, and they went to Iconium saying, it ain't God good. And this time, they're making a midnight move. Amen. They're making that midnight move, it looks like. And, and Paul and Barnabas and his entourage is in the house, and one of their followers is looking out there, and they says, don't look like there's anybody out there now, Paul. <laughs> And they're throwing them backpacks on. They got, they got them backpacks on. They got all their paperwork stuff. They got their best suits rolled up in a ball. And they're leaving everything behind. They ain't got no time to smack their shoes. They ain't got no time to do nothing. They're throwing that giddy up bag on. And they're heading down the road. And they're booking it. Because they said, we've had enough of this. They're going to kill us. And they're saying, Paul, we're scared for your life, man. Get out of here. They're going to kill you. Sometimes God just lets us go through stuff. And when we're in the midst of stuff, sometimes... Sometimes we just, he just slides us through, and then sometimes it gets a little bit more trickier. <laughs> Does it mean because God's not just sliding them out like he did at that first stop, just like he did at Antioch? Does that mean for one second that, that they are failing God at Iconium because it got a little harder? Does it mean that God is scratching his head going, you guys are getting me in a mess. I don't know what I'm going to be doing here. So it's getting tougher, Paul. What, and, and sometimes, let me just be real honest with you, sometimes it seems like life gets that way. We get in one mess, we get out, and then we go, whoo, and then it gets good, and then we get in another stuff, 
And then all of a sudden, it seems like it's harder to get out of this second stuff. And we're thinking that that phrase we mentioned the other day, here we go again. Because this is what we, it's this little four-letter word that we sometimes get all confused with. It's called life. Life's got stuff that happens to us in life. And, and sometimes God just slides us out. Sometimes it gets a little bit tougher. And, and then all of a sudden we see that as, as they're going through this and, and as they're, they're making their way, way through there, they knock the dust off. They go to Iconium. Iconium, there's a great move of God blessings of God. They become aware of opposition and they're getting ready to be assaulted and they're getting ready to, to be stoned. And, and so they head down the road and they say, where are we going? And he said, let's go to Lystra. Man at Lystra, it was good. They were having a move of God. They were, this was, this was one of the most unique. There was, they went to church one day and there was a crippled man there. There was a crippled man there Paul discerned that while he was preaching that he could tell by looking at this guy that this faith was rising. You see, because we're not stupid up here. We can tell when people's faith is rising and we can tell when you're looking at us like, that ain't right. <laughs> and, and we can tell when somebody is saying, I want that. And we can tell when somebody's saying, not me. And this man was sent back there and he was crippled and he was excited and he was all excited and he could tell. And Paul spoke the word of God to him and that, that man jumped up and he was healed and everybody was excited and everything was fired up and my goodness, no wonder we knocked the dust off our feet and it was worth the midnight move. Look at us now, man. We got crippled people. We got empty wheelchairs. We got canes and crutches hanging on the wall. We got, look at us now. We're more than just having people get the Holy Ghost. God is confirming this with signs and wonders and miracles. Look what's going on. And all of a sudden these people came to him and they said, we want to worship you. They said, because one time, one time that, uh, that, that there was a, there was a, a, a visitation from Mercury and, and uh, Jupiter came here and, and, and visited a city in their Greek mythology. And they said, we, we've got statues to them and, and we want to build a statue to you. <laughs> we, want to, we want to build a statue to you. We're going to name a street after you. That'll be called Paul Avenue and Barnabas Boulevard. We got a new subdivision coming in and we're looking for names and, and we'll put your statue there and you'll, you'll be revered in our area because look at the power that you have. You're like God. Look what you got. And Paul stopped him and he said, no, 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 no. No, 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 don't do that. And then he does what he do. He, he begins to preach to them and tell them about Jesus, and that suffices them enough to where they can back off of making them gods. But when they did that, before they did that, and I'm going to get into this in just a minute, but before they did that, everybody worshipped him. But when he said, no, we're just men like you that God uses, and, and you need to worship Jesus, not us, and you need to praise God, not us, all of a sudden then it caused a division. And when it caused a division, then persecution came. Remember? In Antioch, they were talking bad about him and rejecting him, so they left. Then they went to Iconium, and the word got out they were going to kill him, so they snuck out and left. But now, because they refused to let these people worship them and build statues to them, they got all upset and bent, and, and it split the town and it split the people and there became some of them loved them and some of them worshiped God and some of them grew in God and some of them decided we're going to kill them and the Bible says this time they grabbed Paul and threw him down and they stoned him first time they just got upset at him second time they threatened him and the third time they did it 
and they took Paul outside and they just stoned him and they threw stones at him and they, they covered him up with rocks and beat him and he was bloody and bruised and his blood running all over his body till he lay there in a lifeless heap and then all of a sudden when, his, when they left and his followers read him, they surrounded him and they stood over him and they prayed until the life came back in his body. You know what that's called? That's called going through stuff. But when it was all over with, now, now, when it was all over with, when it was all done, you know what Paul said? Paul told Timothy, he said, Hey, remember what I faced when I went to Antioch? And what I faced at Iconium? And what I faced at Lystra? He said, I went through some persecution. I went through some stuff there. But you know what you can say? He said, but out of them all, the Lord delivered me. He did not say that He delivered me once and not twice, or He delivered me twice, but not the third time, and I was stuck on my own. No, but He said, through them all, God delivered me from them all. When he brings this back up, we cannot say that God took care of him. Amen. We cannot say that God took care of him the first time or even the second time, but not at the third time. That would be blasphemy. That'd be blasphemy to say, God, let you never get sick and to let him get a little bit sick, but he let me die. That'd be blasphemy to say that God deals different in one situation. God is a sovereign God. And we need to understand this about God. God is a sovereign God. God does what God wants to do, how He wants to do it, and when He wants to do it, and where He wants to do it. And for us to look at somebody else and say, or a situation in our life, you see, we, we get all messed up on this will of God thing. You know, I'm just wore out of people that, not, not in this church, but people in the world, they want to debate the will of God. Does God have a supreme will? Does God have a tolerant will? Does God have a passive will? Does God, does God do this? God has a will for you and He has a will for me. God has a will and a plan for my life. God has a purpose. I use the term destiny a lot because I believe that God has a destiny for me and God has a destiny for you regardless of how young you are or how old you are. See, Joshua was about to die and God looked at him. He, at least Joshua thought he was about to die. He was an old man and God came up to him and told him one day, he said, look, Joshua, you think you're an old man and just because, and I'm paraphrasing here, but just because it's hard for you to get up and down and when you bend over, you look for other things that may be down there for you to pick up so you don't have to bend down again. Can anybody understand that? Yeah, yeah. He said, you may think you're getting old, but you still got a lot of cities to conquer. You still got a lot of mountains to go through. You still got a lot of victories to win. And we need to understand some things about God and the will of God. There is a will and a plan and a purpose that God has for us in our life. And just because one thing happened smooth and one thing happened hard doesn't mean we're out of the will of God. Well, I must have been out of the will of God today, man. I tell you what, oh, I had two flat tires today. No, that means they got 100,000 miles on 40,000 mile tires. That's what that means. It means you drove through a construction site or down an old rock road and it had, it had gravel that punctured your tire. Or you drove on a building site and you picked up a roofing nail or something. Well, that's what that means. Could it ever, did it ever occur to you that maybe God allowed that nail in your tire to stop you from crossing the track when a train was coming through there that you wouldn't have seen? Did it ever occur to you that God does what God does because God is guiding you and directing you and moving you and blessing you and we just because it's not all like Antioch we think we've messed up or God has forsaken us.
You see, calamity comes. And we get bruised and broken. We just need to learn to hang on. There's that, that old song we sing that comes from the, the words of the, the prophet uh, Isaiah when, 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 he, when he said, They that wait upon the Lord. Okay, let me just, I'm off, I'm just so far off my notes. I feel like I'm in the Holy Ghost here. But some of us, we get into this will of God and backslid today and living for God tomorrow and backslid today and we have a problem today and, and stuff happens today so we can't be living for God or stuff happens tomorrow then God has forsaken us and, and, and all of that kind of stuff. Let me explain something to you today. That's not how it works. Either you're saved or you're lost. If you've got the Holy Ghost, if you've repented, been baptized in His name, and you have the baptism of the Holy Ghost today, you, you don't have to worry about what happens tomorrow. If, if the roof falls in tomorrow, it's not because you thought something you shouldn't think and the Holy Ghost left you and God's punishing you. Stop that nonsense. God's got a plan, and He's got a purpose. He's got you at Antioch, and He's moving you to Iconium, and you may end up in a Lystra, but He didn't leave Paul dead and bleeding and battered in Lystra, but He brought him back, and He restored him, and God will do what God has to do to see you make it through. But God works in our life in a constant basis, and if we're living for Him, the, the steps of a good man are ordered of God. And so that means if I go to, if I'm living for God on Monday, and I go to Antioch on Tuesday, and everything is just all right, and I end up on Wednesday at Iconium, and it gets a little bit rougher, it doesn't mean that my steps are not ordered of God. And it doesn't mean I've got to have a 15-hour session with God every day to know what to do. And i got to wait on a word from God to tell me to read my Bible, or to go pay my water bill, or a word from God to tell me i got to get up and go to work or in the summertime I don't need God to wake me up and tell me to go mow my well, I don't know if it's the will of God for me to mow my yard today you got a lawnmower and the grass needs mowing it's the will of God I don't know if it's the will of God for me to go to work today you got a job and they tell you to be there at 8 o'clock it's the will of God I don't know if it's the will of God for me to stay with my family you said till death do us part it's the will of God I don't know if it's the will of God for me to raise these kids. He gave them to you. I don't know if it's the will of God for me to go to church. There is a church. And He said, forsake not the assembly of ourselves together. It's the will. I don't know if it's the will of God for me to stay in church. Are you serious? Iconium's come. Lystras happen, but through them all, through that all that stuff, through all that junk. Sister and I, we talked about it before church. Some of the stuff that we've been through, how did we do it? Because God is faithful and God kept His hand on us and God takes you through them because He has a plan and a purpose. Just have to learn to hang on to God. And learn to wait on the Lord, and we too will say, out of all of this, the Lord has delivered me. Real quickly, I want to look at some of the peril that Paul faced and see how they parallel today. You know, the greatest peril that Paul faced was the opposition, because there's something about us, all of us, me and you and every one of us, we just want to be liked. I don't know anybody that says, I hope everybody hates me. We want, we want people to like us. I, I, I know it happens, and I, I'm, I've been doing this for 40-some years, and I know everybody don't like every message I preach, and that's all fine, and that's all good. But, but I want everybody, I'll be honest with you, I want everybody to like my preaching. I want everybody to like me as a pastor. I want everybody to like that. But I'm smart enough to know, Brother Steve, that from time to time there's going to be somebody that don't. 
They're just not going to. But their, their biggest peril that Paul faced was opposition, you see. And, and what causes opposition is not so much personalities, because if you don't like somebody's personality, you can, you don't, you don't, just because you don't like somebody that doesn't like my personality probably has other weaknesses, but they, that was a joke. <laughs> but, <laughs> They probably got other issues they're dealing with in life, you know. But, <laughs> so we just bunch it all in. But, but if people oppose the gospel, see, the Lord told Samuel, He said, they're not, they, when, when Saul went nuts and, and, and Samuel just freaked out, he lost, he got all depressed and despondent. And the Lord went up to him and said, hey, don't worry about it, man. He said, they're, they're not rejecting you. He said, he didn't even reject you. He said, he rejected me. You just happened to be the go between God. You, you just, they just took it out on you. It really wasn't you, it was God. So you know where opposition comes in from? Opposition comes from disobedience. If you don't want to do what's right with God, you get mad at the preacher. You, we, everybody here should say amen because everybody likes me. <laughs> but, but if you get mad at me, that's, that's what it is. Preacher says, thou shalt not, according to the word of God, you shall not. Die. Who is he? Ain't no preacher telling me what. Well, he ain't telling you what to do. God's telling you what to do. So opposition comes. Paul, they weren't mad at Paul, but they, they opposed Paul because they were disobedient to the word of God. Now we're getting into the deeper water. But, but opposition, disobedience produces opposition, and opposition will produce hatred, and, 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 and in the biblical way, hatred then will produce stoning. I'm glad we're not doing that to preachers today, but, but it, it comes from the And what, what really it does is disobedience produces opposition, and opposition produces hatred, and hatred produces rejection. And man, that we, we, just, we do anything. We put up with anything in our lives, in our jobs, in our, in our marriages, in our homes, in, in any relationship, we put up with so much not to feel that rejection. If you can't say amen, bob your head. Amen. It's, it's a truth. It's a truth. We, we, we do that. And then and, and it, it just happens. And the greatest peril they faced was when the people wanted to worship them. Okay, let me peel off another layer here. The Bible says that we are created in the image of God. Okay? And we're created in the image of God. Man, we got some diverse looking folks in here. Who is he? Who does he look like? Me or you? Or you? Or you? Who does he look like? Does he look like Eli with his lot of hair? Or does he look like my brother Crane over there with no hair? Who's, who does he look like? Who, who does he look like? Does he look, does he look, how tall are you, Max? I'm 5'9". I've shrunk an inch and a half since I was, was he, was he short like me and Brother Williams? How tall are you, Brother Williams? 5'4", or 6'2", or so. Well, what, what, does he, what does he look like? You know, what, what color of skin does, does God in creation have when he created us? I'm, let me explain something to you. You know how God created us in his own image? Not that he has, because God's uh, omnipresent. He's everywhere. God doesn't have fingers. He uses those terms so we can understand how he does things. God doesn't have eyes like we have eyes, where, or ears like we have ears. Well, the Bible says his ear, he uses those terms, and there's a great big term for that, that he uses that term so that he puts it in language that we can understand how that God hears us. But God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. Let me explain how God, and you've heard me say this before, but this is how we are like God. Every emotion that you have, every emotion you have, God has that. Well, I'm a jealous person. The Bible says God's jealous over us. Well, I get angry. God gets angry. But I love. God loves. Every emotion you have. And you know what God desires? To the point where He says that, He says this. He said, there's no God besides me and I'll share my glory with none. 
That's what he said. He said, I ain't no sharing my glory with nobody. He said, I created the heavens and the earth. I created the dust. I created the trees. I created the sun. I created the moon. I created all this stuff. And he said, I'm not giving anybody else any credit for that. And nobody better stand up and take credit for that. He said, I'm not sharing that with anybody. And God has this emotion and this desire in him where he desires to be glorified and worshipped. But he created me in his own image. Now, I don't expect anybody to say amen to this, but you know what we all like? We all like the credit. <laughs> sure, now come on now. That's why companies have employee of the month. And that's why they don't mind if you get employee of the month, you don't mind parking in it. Now, I'm just being real. We all like that attaboy. We all like that bonus. We all like that promotion. We all like, and there's nothing, that that's okay to a point until we get to the place where we realize that everything I've got and everything I've attained and everything else, I've, I've, I give the glory to God. If I've got anything in life, I give the glory to God. If I've got any talent, you know, the big debate, and this is Super Bowl week, and all they're talking about is, is goat this and goat that and greatest of all time and, and, and greatest of, that's what goat stands for. He's the goat. They got the old goat and the young goat. They got, they got Tom Brady and, and Patrick Mahomes. They got the young goat and the old goat. When the old goat's gone, the new goat will be in there, greatest of all time, and the greatest of all time, and everybody wants to be the goat. And your quarterback, what's his name? The Packers quarterback, what's his name? I can't, my mind just, Rodgers, he's aggravated because he's not the goat because they said he can't be the goat because he didn't get to the Super Bowl. But if he'd have got to the Super Bowl, then maybe he would have been in the, in the balloting or the top five running for the next goat. And they're just going nuts. They're going to demand a trade to another team where I have a better chance to become the goat. I want to be the goat be the goat. <laughs> Lord, son, I ain't sharing my glory. There ain't no other goat besides him. He's the greatest of all time. He's the almighty. He's the first and the last and the greatest and there was. There's none of that, none of that beside him. But there's something inside of us. We like to take the credit for some things. And Paul said, I ain't taking the credit for this, boys. Woo! You know, I read something one time and it said, if a, ministry, if a ministry has to have the man's name on the front of it, the Mark Morris healing crusade, it's the Mark Morris ministries. One of these days God will step back and say, all right, let's see what Mark Morris can do. Do your thing, goat. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Paul said, it ain't me, boys. It ain't me. You don't need to build no statue to me. You don't need to build no monument to me because it's all about him. And then Paul told Timothy, he said, look at this, Timothy. He said, it ain't about me. It's about him because I went through these three things and I suffered this persecution and I wrestled with this. But it ain't about me. It's because it was him. All through them all, the Lord delivered me. The supreme peril that we face is a desire for worldly approval. What if Paul, and I'm closing real quick, five minutes I'll be done. But what if Paul had went through everything he went through and never had a problem? What if he'd have never had an Iconium or a Lystra? And then Bartimus or John Mark or one of these other preachers would have came along and then they would have had a problem. What if Timothy would have came along years later and... and and somebody would have just knocked the socks off of him. <laughs> you 
you know what Timothy could have looked at it and he could have said, I'm doing something wrong. How are you doing something wrong, Timothy? Because Paul never did this. Paul started preaching and he never had any opposition. Paul started preaching and everybody got healed. Paul started preaching and they wanted to build monuments to him. And I'm over here and I've got my tent up and I'm standing in the synagogue and there ain't nobody listening to me. I'm, I'm out of the will of God. Well, I got a church of 50 people, 100 people, and half of them don't like me. I had a friend of mine one time got done preaching on a Sunday night, and he was in a church that was seated like this, and he said, I got done talking to somebody over here, and all of a sudden he said, instead of everybody leaving, they all just parted on two sides. And he said, I thought, that's strange. wonder what's going on. And he said, then there was a man come from each side to him and told him, he said, Pastor, we voted, and this side wants you to go, and this side wants you to stay. I said, what'd you do? He, and he was standing on my doorstep <laughs> hundreds of miles away and three or four different states later. And, and he, was, he was in Illinois and I was in Tennessee and he was standing on my door. And I said, what, what are you doing here then? He said, I didn't stay. He said, he said, the side that wanted me to go had more people and I had to go. But you know, he, he never quit. He never backslid. He never got drunk. He stayed at my house for about a week. He got up and he left and he went back and, and he started evangelizing. He's now pastoring a great big church in Oklahoma. He's doing a fantastic job, and that's been 35 years ago. You know what? He can stand up here today and say, hey, if you're going to do, if you're going to live this thing called life, you're going to go through it. There are some of us that are here today that have not had everything perfect. Some of us have been through some stuff. Some of us are no stranger to poverty. Some of us are no strangers to rejection. Some of us are no strangers to opposition. Some of us are no stranger to sickness and death and all kinds of heartaches. And we've been through a little bit of everything. And we have a tendency to look around and see how everybody is and say they don't have a clue what it's like to be poor. Or they don't have a clue what it's like to lose somebody. Or they don't have a clue what it's like to go through what I'm going through. They don't know what it's like to have a bad marriage. They don't know what it's like to have kids. They don't know what it's like. They don't know what it's like. But let me tell you something. The reason why we are here today is because we are like Paul. We can say through them all God delivered us. God kept us. Whether it was easy, whether it was hard, or whether it seemed insurmountable, we stuck with God and God delivered us. supreme per peril we face is trying to make everybody think we got it perfect. Sister Morris, we don't have it perfect. Nobody's, nobody in this building is living the absence of problems. Even these babies get the belly ache and teething problems. And then when you get our age, you still got the same problems. <laughs> 